Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to now have uh, the opportunity uh, to talk to Professor Anthony King, of course, who is Professor of Strategic Studies at Exeter University and um, an expert, I think, uh, on international wars. Um, grimly sums it up, <laughs> doesn't it, Professor? Uh, sure. Look, I, I'm not sure if you had the opportunity, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking this angle today to talk about this, that William Hague ran a, an interesting article in The Times, um, and, and I saw you nod there, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you had a chance to look at it, but I want to pick up his central theme, was that actually uh, Hamas motivation, which I think a lot of people were saying, why now from Hamas did they do this? His argument uh, is that um, Iran, very closely linked to Hamas, see it as in the interests of destabilizing a region that was growing to both invest, work and develop partnerships with Israel. And this is not something that a state that wants the destruction of Israel wanted to see, particularly new agreement with Saudi Arabia. He's saying, if you go in and you go in hard, as you may feel justified to do so in Gaza, this would be a huge mistake playing into the hands of Hamas. Do you have any thoughts about his thinking on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, William Hayes got a lot of experience. Um, he's foreign secretary uh, uh, and he's a deeply knowledgeable and intelligent observer. And, and I think, and I saw the article, uh, I, I, and I think his analysis is, is, is accurate. Um, I, I mean, you know, it seems absolutely clear. I mean, almost every commentator has argued that Iran and the Islamic Revolutionary um, uh, uh, Guard Corps is behind this. And I concur with that. I think that the scale and the imaginativeness and the atrocities, uh, the level of the atrocities, um, take Hamas to a different level than they've been, but are consistent with those that kind of organisation, Iranian-backed organisations. And I think um, Iran has been looking, especially since 2003, since the Iraq invasion, to expand its influence over the region. Um, and I think it, it is threatened uh, by those um, Abraham uh, 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 Accords mm -hmm. and particularly by the overtures by Saudi Arabia to make an, a, a rapprochement with Israel, which, you know, has the implication of actually rebalancing the region. Now, it's, it would be a rebalance which, which would be seems to be to disadvantageous to those Palestinians in the occupied territories, uh, but over uh, over the region uh, would be very disadvantageous, that rebalancing towards uh, Iran, essentially it would put the, uh, it would create an axis between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So I, I, I agree with William Hay completely here. It, yeah. it's, it's interesting because part of that analysis, I think is therefore suggesting that, you know, 10 years ago, definitely 20 years ago, but 10 years ago, Palestine, as an issue, was at the forefront of foreign policy for every other country in that region, uh, and, and it dominated thinking. It, it therefore follows that if people are effectively, let's keep it simple, looking to work with Israel, reach accords uh, with Israel, that it's the question of Palestine itself is no longer top of their agenda. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I mean... It, I... I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd say across the board that that Palestine is not uh, 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 not the top of the agenda. I mean, it's remained a key issue. The whole issue of the occupied territories um, and Israel's relation to them, the possibility now, the unviability of the Oslo Accords. I mean, I, 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 one of the things is you know it's a region which's been afflicted by a series of of pretty disastrous events. Um, obviously, the Iraq War and then of course the Syrian civil war has been a, a major issue. Um, I, 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 and of course, lower down the Gulf, um, uh, Yemen has also distracted the attention of, of many of the Gulf states and Arabic states. So, I mean, it, it's it's true that there's been so much turmoil uh, that it's not the only issue. But I, I would suggest it's remained a very important one, not be, not least because um, the issue of Israel um, is, you know, especially in terms of Iran, they are so severely opposed to it. Um, so, so. Uh, you know, and this this event absolutely, you know, which is what what it's which it was designed to do, um, puts it absolutely back at the top of the agenda. I mean, it's a it's a it's a scale we've not seen, and and that scale has only just started. And, Let, let's uh, be clear about 
well. Exactly. And, and let me take you down that road if, uh, of looking ahead based on your experience. Uh, there's this growing almost acceptance there's going to be a ground invasion, there's going to be a ground war to take place. Presumably, Israel's goal then will be just to clear Hamas out and then what? Occupy the region again? Well, th this is where um, I think the strategic level thinking starts to point to Tehran uh, because essentially um, the, the, these atrocious actions have put Israel into a very difficult situation. It is inconceivable that any state having a thousand civilians killed, raped, abducted, murdered in the way that they were is not is going to is, is not going to retaliate. Um, so um, Hamas and Iran, its Iranian backers, if they are indeed there, know that. But the military options and indeed the political options are horrible. Um, so that is one option: a complete clearance of Gaza and an occupation. But of course. The IDF withdrew, the Israeli Defence Force mm. withdrew from Gaza in 2005, after, after nearly 50 years, 40 years, um, because it was an unpalatable operation that was going nowhere. So, it, the, you know, in, in some case, in some ways, some kind of clearance is going to be required for revenge purposes and to draw down and to attrit Hamas capabilities, leadership, infrastructure, etc. I would probably think Israel will go for a li series of more limited, ra they're more than raids, but heavy raids into Gaza Strip with discrete targets, which they'll destroy and eliminate, and then withdraw uh, and, and, in, and institute some kind of more siege-like operation. I think a complete clearance, I mean, it's, it's conceivable, it's possible, I think a complete clearance of the entire Gaza Strip and an occupation, mm, I, I, I wonder about that militarily. Either option militarily also is not very happy because Hamas, of course, will resist those interventions and is the idea of the Israeli Defence Force will be drawn into pretty difficult close urban fighting, which is some of the most difficult fighting you do. So the options for Israel, uh, I mean, ha the Hamas-Iranian strategy here is terrible but really quite clever uh, in terms of presenting a, Israel with a conundrum. And, and part of that conundrum, uh, presumably, is that, they w that Hamas and Iran would have absolutely no problem if Hezbollah carried on lobbing missiles from Lebanon, trying to draw that part of the, that, if you like, split the efforts of Israel to defend itself. I mean, I think that's already started. And I think, uh, I mean, people are predicting a three-front war, i.e. Um, Hamas in the south, Hamas and um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, in in the West Bank and Hezbollah, particularly in the north. Hezbollah are very powerful. Um, yes, that would be for Israel's enemies. That would be the perfect solution, uh, the perfect sort of option. And therefore, I think that, unfortunately, is extremely likely. But, of course, that will radicalise Israel's own defence of itself with the prospect and almost inevitability of a really significant conflict. I mean, a conflict of the scale of the 82 war in Syria, 73, and, and even worse, perhaps. So, um, I, you know, I, I've got to admit, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about the possible outcomes of this event, uh, you know, which, which in my view are truly dreadful. Just one, one throw this curveball to, to the left of you, one final question. Sure. Putin must be delighted that there's this huge conflict about to take place in the Middle East because he must feel this will advance his chances in Ukraine and anything destabilises the West is a good thing? Well, people have made this claim, and and so what I'm about to say, I have, I this is total inference. Um, I've got no special evidence for this. I'm actually pretty sceptical about this. I think uh, the Ukraine war, the Russia-Ukraine war, shows the limitation of um, the Kremlin's strategic ability and imagination. I just don't think they've got the bandwidth to have been behind this in any way whatsoever. I think they've got more than enough on their plate trying to uh, trying to stabilise. I suppose the I, I agree with you. I don't think they're behind it 
but do you sense that they're going to exploit this and see perhaps um, differences appearing on so Republicans in America might not want to support Ukraine, but they might want to support sure. um, support uh, Israel. Listen, I've, I've run out of time. Fascinating conversation. And thank you very much indeed, Professor Anthony King, uh, Professor of Strategic Studies at Exeter University.